Welcome everyone to our lunch plenary on cultural adaptations of evidence-based interventions to fit to context. I am very proud uh, to introduce Dr. Noe Pimpasone Brady, uh, who's been a, a longtime colleague of mine. Uh, Dr. Pimpasone Brady is a senior instructor in the Department of Psychiatry here at the University of Colorado. She is a current K-12 scholar with the NIH-funded Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health, or the BIRCH program, through the Center for Women's Health Research, which I think actually has a new name recently. Um, as a clinical health psychologist, her expertise is in the area of women's health and mental health across integrated care settings, specifically perinatal mental health, reproductive health, polycystic ovarian syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and weight management. As an integrated psychologist researcher, her program of research seeks to understand and address sex and gender differences in the development of mental illness and chronic medical conditions, the individual system and cultural level determinants to the implementation, adaptation, and sustainability of mental health interventions while managing chronic medical diseases, especially for women of color. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Pimpasone Brady to tell us about cultural adaptations. Thank you, Bethany. My introduction always sounds so nice when someone else reads it instead of me reading it, so I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for coming here and joining me during your lunch hour. Um, hopefully you'll learn a little bit about, uh, kind of a, have a side of cultural adaptations while you are enjoying your lunch. And so with this talk, my learning objectives are to explain the importance of and need to culturally adapt evidence-based interventions to fit to context, while paying attention to target, um, targeting populations, language, culture, and context. Um, and then I'll also describe and integrate appropriate cultural adaptations frameworks for studying the processes and impacts of adaptations on the intervention adoption, implementation, and effectiveness. And so scholars from the field of implementation science and cultural adaptation science um, have really warned of the dangers of implementing evidence-based interventions without attending to the fit of the interventions to the context, the populations that are being served, um, the different providers who deliver these interventions and the diversity of service settings that could benefit from these interventions. You know, frankly, this is what this entire three day conference is about. So I think we're all getting a really great learning experience and trying to um, address this this danger. And when we're referring to adaptations in particular, where we're really discussing modifying the intervention to fit the provider context the organizational context and the service settings, and, and in particular, paying attention to the historical, political, and the economic context in which these interventions will likely be delivered. Um, so this is attending to the fit needs, resources, as well as the preferences of who will gain to benefit from these interventions, as well as who will be delivering these interventions. Cultural adaptations in particular, is aimed to really bring together the, the best of multicultural and evidence-based interventions um, integrated to the, the advanced research of psychological treatments um, so that we can consider culture and context in a much more thoughtful and, and systematic way. Um, there are two core motivating factors for engaging in cultural adaptations. One is to protect the scientific integrity of evidence-based research and dissemination by promoting the ecological validity of treatment studies. And two, reduce health disparities by making these interventions broadly available to different cultural groups that we know can benefit from them. <clears throat> so there's lots of overlap between implementation science and cultural adaptations. They align very similarly. Um, uh, I think with this talk, my slides are already available, um, and so this information is there, but really attending to the first and, and this last row. So, you know, with the definition of implementation science, we're looking at the, the scientific promotion and integration of, of findings into healthcare policy and practice. Cultural adaptations is kind of the other side, other coin of that, we, we, where we are doing a systematic modification that's meant to be compatible with the user's cultural patterns and meanings. Um, and the challenges in both fields have been that some implementation trials have not yet considered the adaptation process when they're implementing that intervention. 
I know there's much more of a motivation to do that now currently. Um, and then with cultural adaptations, there's just been a lack of explicit attention to the implementation context, as well as what are the exact implementation strategies um, that will be effective into delivering these interventions and adapted interventions into different settings. So why would we adapt? Well, I think we're all aware that there is a mismatch between the intervention contact, content, the population, and the settings in which we're trying to deliver this intervention. We know there's lots of research out there showing that there are disparities um, and differential impacts of the intervention, depending on lots of different contextual factors. There's also been a significant lack of involvement of race, racial, and ethnic groups in the development and testing of the interventions. And a practice that was happening a lot, a lot previously is racial and ethnic minoritized groups were considered kind of after the fact when recruitment was really low or when there was an issue uh, with outcomes um, in a certain group. And then there is a risk of transporting and promoting assimilation to Western values, norms, and beliefs on others, particularly groups that have been minoritized from either a race, ethnic perspective, or even uh, we can think of sex and gender, as well as sexual orientation as well. So the consequences of not considering um, cultural adaptations or adaptations in particular is this loss of effectiveness uh, of your intervention, certainly uh, the potential worsening of health disparities, and then the lack of uptake at the different settings that we're trying to deliver these interventions. So how would we then distinguish and start to study cultural adaptations? Um, so I'll talk about more broadly, just how we, would, how we would consider and study adaptations. And then I'll walk through three specific cultural adaptations frameworks that you might consider integrating into your own research. And so when we're trying to distinguish adaptations in particular, we can think about them as planned versus unplanned. So do we know that you know, staff turnover is likely going to happen in this setting, or do we not know that staff turnover is likely going to happen in this setting? And then how do we react to those adaptations? Um, we can look into see if the adaptations are fidelity consistent um, with the intervention. So tailoring um, the intervention and not necessarily the core components or the core content of the intervention, um, changing session length, adding relevant modules, but really the intent is that the core interventions are, are intact. And then there's this fidelity inconsistent. So adding conceptually different strategies, drifting from the protocol, and in some ways, essentially developing a new intervention if the core components are not intact. Study approaches that you might consider are ones that we would consider you know, across implementation science as well as pragmatic science. Uh, so you might consider participatory methods with, with the cultural or ethnic group that you would want to adapt this intervention with. So stakeholder and community engagement are particularly key. Human-centered design research. So co-creating programs and materials with the group to ensure that it's not just implemented successfully, but can also be disseminated on a wider scale. And then use of different um, adaptations um, and context frameworks that we can consider in terms of how does that adapted intervention fit in the setting or fit with this, within this community? Um, and I know lots of these frameworks have already been discussed so far. Study designs are also, for cultural adaptations, are also ones that we might consider in, from implementation science. Um, so in particular, the adaptive designs um, can be really important to improve the efficiency from the perspective of multiple stakeholders by helping determine you know, what constitutes the best dose, the best frequency, and under what conditions does this intervention need to be modified. Um, and I think really going into more of an iterative design from start to finish can, we way, can be a way to assure that you, your outcomes are effective as well as your implementation is successful. And so in thinking about cultural adaptations frameworks in particular, um, with the handout that comes with this presentation, 
there I added a, a reference in terms of uh, just much more cultural adaptation frameworks, but these have been the three main ones um, utilized within the literature. So the cultural sensitivity framework, cultural adaptation process model, and the cultural adaptation framework. And something to consider across all of these frameworks is it's, I'll describe them to make them look like they're kind of in this phase step-by-step -step approach, but it really is more of an iterative uh, process where you, where you are partnering really closely with the group that you um, would want to see these outcomes in. So with the cultural sensitivity framework, Resna Cal um, and their colleagues suggested more of a mixed methods approach um, to, as well as integrating kind of prior research to inform your adaptations. So really considering kind of the ethnic and cultural characteristics, norms, values, beliefs, um, into kind of the design delivery and the evaluation of either your program, your targeted health materials, um, or, or message framing that, that you're trying to um, uh, send to this group. And so there are two different processes to consider during the cultural sensitivity framework. One is, um, are there surface level adaptations that are needed? So do we need to improve the, the visual appeal of it, the content or the messages, you know, the design of it? Does it need to look kind of like the population that we're hoping to deliver this intervention with or improve the intervention with? Um, or are there certain messages or phrases or even languages that we might need to consider? And then there are deep uh, level adaptations. So really trying to um, understand predictors of the problems as well as the contextual factors that will influence whether or not that intervention gets um, adopted and utilized. The cultural adaptation process model um, is designed in three phases, but again, very iterative. So phase one is setting the stage by collaborating with the intervention fit or the developer um, with a cultural adaptation specialist. So someone who is aware of that culture um, or group that you're hoping to adapt this intervention for. Um, that person then determines the fit within the literature as well as meeting with key community leaders. So this is where essentially conducting a needs assessment um, it happens. And this, you can do this by conducting focus, focus groups to determine the fit, um, as well as interviewing with uh, community leaders to ensure that, you know, does this, does this intervention, will this intervention actually work with your group? And we need to know that at the outset. Phase two then involves actually tailoring the intervention prior to delivery ensuring that your measures um, have been checked for theoretical and cultural appropriateness. Um, I would say in this case, we don't have a ton of pragmatic measures and it would really be a lot of one of those long length, lengthy self-report measures that psychologists like to use. Um, and then observing cultural adaptations in the field and testing it iteratively. So actually going out um, and seeing how well your intervention, your adapted intervention works with that culture and then coming back and revising. And then phase three involves um, adaptations iterations by capturing adaptations in the new version of treatment. So continuing to refine, adapt and refine, refine and finalize your measures to field test it. And when you are doing and engaging in phase three, you attend more to the acceptability of it, how compatible, appropriate and feasible is it um, to, to the group that you're interested in working with and, and in particular, the language, who is delivering it, what are some common metaphors, languages, or symbols that you need to consider, what's the content, and if that content reflects common values or issues, um, and well, as well as, you know, contextual issues like, you know, migration and acculturation stress. And then finally, the cultural adaptation framework. Um, which again, it looks like it's in steps, but it's very iterative. So uh, in terms of information gathering, again, determine your needs assessment. Does it need to be adapted? And if so, what intervention components should be modified? Um, then the preliminary adaptation design is integrating 
informa uh, information from this first information gathering phase to inform preliminary modifications. Um, and really ensuring that, you know, if there are core components that need to be kept intact, or if we're moving more towards that fidelity inconsistent and essentially developing a new intervention. This is where doing, engaging in a qualitative study can be most helpful to gather opinions and beliefs from those who are delivering it, as well as those who are going to benefit from it. And then going out and pilot testing with a preliminary adaptation test, continuing to refine, so engaging in more of a mixed methods approach, um, going and refining the intervention based on your outcomes, quantitative and qualitative outcomes um, in your pilot testing and then refining it, and then actually conducting a full cultural adaptation trial, and then also getting in-depth feedback uh, on, that, on that trial. So I'm going to pause here for any questions. Because I also have learned that I can't mind, I can't present and look at chat at the same time. So that's really tricky. So the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is really lead you through essentially a program of research that I have been involved in um to date in terms of my professional career on how did we culturally adapt and and make cognitive behavioral therapy feasible for latino women who have binge eating disorder and so in here we we used the cultural sensitivity framework we also utilized the cultural adaptation framework and and following the cultural adaptation framework, our first stage was to really try to understand, you know, should we adapt? Is there, inf is there enough information to support our need to adapt this intervention? So we know that bulimia um, and binge eating disorder are comparable between white women and Latino women, and both groups want help. White women in particular, they're more likely to have utilized what we consider are, are traditional or, or westernized approaches to this treatment. So utilizing psychotherapists, psychiatrists, medications, whereas Latino women were less likely to seek help. They want help, but they're less likely to actually go out and get help. And if they did, they were less likely to be diagnosed or, or treated. So they were more likely to go to their general practitioners or PCPs for weight concerns. So not eating concerns, but weight concerns. And uh, Latino culture tends to place more of a higher degree on the cultural meaning of food um, and, and eating that intersects with acculturation stress, uh, immigration stress, as well as limited family and social support and understanding of what eating disorders are. So we you know, went back and went into the literature, we conducted our own study, and we really found that these results highlight the importance of considering cultural beliefs and trying to address uh, eating disorders in Latino women. And again, with our information gathering phase and with our preliminary adaptation design, we sought to see if CBT would be acceptable and culturally relevant. So CBT is widely considered the treatment of choice for bulimia in bed. And the problem with CBT is that it requires special training. So you have to be pretty adequately trained to deliver CBT in its you know, developed form. So really thinking about that, that issue between fidelity and adaptations. Um, and so we looked into delivering CBT in more of a, more of a guided self-help format. So that really involves, that's more of a low intensity intervention in which the user, so whoever is going to benefit from this, follows a self-help manual, a structured self-help manual with the assistance of a specialist and a non-specialist, we call the non-specialist a supporter or a coach that can be delivered in both clinical and non-clinical settings. And so this type of format, delivering CBT as a guided self-help approach um, helps to increase the reach of the intervention as well as um, um, we can then extend it to different populations. And, and, and with the use of the supporter, we don't necessarily need to um, change the, the core components of that intervention, but through the use of supporter, whose main role is to 
cheerlead, motivate, problem solve, troubleshoot through the intervention, as well as think about, you know, how do issues of acculturation and language um, affect their engagement in, in that um, with the program or with the intervention. So we took the uh, most rec the widely recommended program to treat binge eating. So this is Dr. Fairburn's Overcoming Binge Eating Manual. It's available in both English and in Spanish. Um, and we, we looked at both surface and deep structure of this manual. So you can see here, there are six steps um, that, that each participant, each person will go through in a self-help format. And frankly, they can go and buy this on Amazon today and use it today uh, without the use of a supporter. So again, this program, the way that it's structured is designed to be delivered by, by a person who has no background in mental health or, or is an expert in the treatment of uh, binge eating or, or bed. So the first half of this book has education around eating disorders, specifically bulimia in bed. And then the second half, is the actual steps uh, based on CBT. The steps are meant to be um, additive um, to address eating habits and other associated problems, psychological problems associated with eating disorders. And so we took this manual um, in our preliminary adaptation design. We then conducted bilingual focus groups of Latino women who participated in a prior study with us with uh, who have been previously diagnosed with binge eating disorder. And these are the main themes that came out of our focus groups. Um, in short, they experienced tension and conflicts with others in their family and in their community, as well as within themselves regarding their, regarding eating problems that they had, um, and how their perspectives of cultural beliefs, values, and acculturation levels moderated this experience and tension. This all then really has an influence on their help-seeking attitudes or the likelihood that they would like to actually go out and get help, um, as well as their likelihood to engage in the manual. Um, and so knowing this context about uh, the CBT GSH manual helps us better understand what's the likelihood uh, of folks um, wanting to actually engage in it. And part of this is what do we need to adapt? What are the core components or what parts of this intervention do we need to change? And they had four main suggestions for adapting the intervention to make it fit better to them. So thinking about surface and deep structure adaptations. So what we did was we added a session prior to uh, starting the first step where they engaged in role play and vignettes. So we really called it more of an orientation session. And the aim of that was to learn, develop some coping strategies and problem solve to address families' lack of support and maybe some negative feedback that they might get um, from their uh, social group. We also added a Mexican American food guide um, in the manual as that was not in there before. And that was something that they really needed on normal food portions, as well as what, is, does, what does a healthy distribution of American and Latino foods uh, look like? We also conducted, again, the support sessions with the supporter. And the aim of the support sessions is to encourage them through the program, help them uh, build hope help them feel really more empowered about managing their eating um, and then helping them problem solve through. And then our supporters were trained um, and received sensitivity training and supervision on Latinas worldviews, their life experiences, as well as their social context that would likely influence engagement and treatment and improving uh, eating disorder behaviors. And so through our preliminary adaptation feasibility test and refinement, we found that there's really high treatment adherence um, in, in the culturally adapted manual. And the reasons for really dropping out, it was there's too much commitment, program was too burdensome, and there was still interference from unsupportive family members that they had trouble navigating. 
But we found that about 36% were abstinent from binge eating um, and about 39% received um, or achieved diagnostic remission from bulimia bed and recurrent binge eating um, episodes. We also found symptom reduction in binge eating frequency, their levels of distress, surprisingly BMI. This intervention is not designed to lose weight, but designed to address your eating problems that could lead to high weight status. Um, and so if, if it's really interesting that we found a reduction in BMI, certainly reductions in eating concerns, shape and weight concerns, and improvements in self-esteem. Um, and in terms of their acceptability of the program or how helpful they thought it was, um, it, uh, participants rated it as somewhat helpful to very helpful. And again, the guided support sessions were, were just really necessary to and needed to be strengthened to increase family and peer support. So, so after this, we didn't make too many refinements to the actual intervention. What we did was provide more support sessions for them to meet uh, with our supporters as they went through the program. So we didn't actually change anything in terms of content, just provided more support and role played a little bit more with them. And so in our cultural adaptation trial, once we did a, we did, we did a, a, weight lot, a weight list control trial, and something I actually forgot to mention is when we did our preliminary adaptation design, we delivered it in the greater Los Angeles area primarily with Mexican-American women. We then took this intervention to North Carolina. So if we're thinking about even geographical context and how different that might be to more of a multi-ethnic Latina group. And we still found pretty similar results from pilot phase to our uh, waitlist randomized control trial phase. So we found that treatment resulted in reductions in binge eating frequency, depression and psychological distress, about um, 48% were abstinent from binge eating um, at follow-up, at one month follow-up. And then they were really highly satisfied with this program and suggested that dissemination can be a, a good feasible first step um, and a minimal intervention for Latinas with binge eating disorder. So what we've learned from this process is that we've really appealed to a population that would otherwise not receive professional or psychological help uh, because of cultural, financial, and institutional barriers. And this semi-structured approach of delivering um, the GSH program couples both structure and flexibility with the aim of, de of decreasing perceived stigma and barriers and associated with um, treatment for eating disorders. And it's also a pretty low cost treatment and provides an alternative to coming into a therapist's office um, and you know, getting six sessions of CBT there. <clears throat> so finally, the cross-cutting themes across cultural adaptations, and I think we can probably extend this out to adaptations in particular, is you know, conducting a needs assessment with the tar target ethno-cultural group is pretty key. Also looking within the literature in terms of what needs to be adapted, as well as seeking feedback. Then this iterative approach, uh, Iterative process is really important on designing and testing culturally adapted interventions using multiple methods. And then pilot test and seeking um, feedback to refine and improve in your larger trial. And what we've seen through this process is that interventions can be adapted to improve fit and compatibility and be easily disseminated to improve the accessibility and engagement. Again, with the ultimate goal to achieve health equity and reduce health disparities in certain outcomes. So these are a list of key cultural adaptation references. I believe those are in the handouts that are provided with this talk. And thank you all for tuning in. I'm happy to discuss questions. Thank you so much, Noe. That was great. Um, I really love this example. I think it, it really nicely exemplifies both the methodology and the value of this approach. Mm -hmm. um, anyone in the audience who has questions, you can take your, you can put yourself on video, take yourself off mute to, um, to ask questions, or you can put questions in the chat. Um, Russ makes the point um, that he, he really likes this idea of thinking about cultural adaptation, not just at the beginning and the planning stage, but really continuing in an iterative fashion throughout um, the life of a program. Um, any comments on that, Noe? 
Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, when we started this program, we the aim of this wasn't thinking about, you know, implementation science in mind, but thinking about cultural adaptation in mind. So I think if we had continued this from an iterative perspective, I think we would have been able to see and really reach a, a greater population. Um, I think for the studies as well, the studies that I presented, we delivered it within women who are in the community, as well as those trying to seek care in primary care settings. So we can think about, you know, how can we deliver this um, in like a community mental health center or within primary care settings to, to improve, again, the dissemination of it. Um, Brad asks, in the RCT portion of your work, do you, you talk a little bit about control groups and mm -hmm. sort of the appropriateness of, of waitlist controls or, or, or any sort of controls? Mm -hmm. um, how do we figure out what the best comparisons are? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think we chose waitlist control for the purposes of our study um, because we knew this was a population that um, had binge eating disorder, but had never really sought treatment before. And so we wanted to make sure that we had an appropriate control group so that when they go through the program, we can compare with that group. And then for those who are in the control group, they, they were offered the intervention 12 weeks later. Um, so that really allowed us to, and, and we didn't evaluate kind of how they did, how the control group, weightless control group did once they were in the intervention phase. But again, that really allowed us to deliver the intervention even out of you know, a research context um, because they knew they were in the weightless control. Um, we told them, you know, this is a 12 week waitlist control. And then afterwards you have the option of, of entering into the intervention if you would like to. So we made it readily available um, um, to our participants. But I think that's, you know, if we're thinking about just adapting um, in particular, and it's, you know, a huge theme is stakeholder engagement. So what, what would the community perceive as an appropriate control group for them? or what seems to be more, you know, if you're trying to implement in primary care, what's, what is the appropriate, you know, treatment as usual group um, to compare your intervention to. And so I think that's something to consider kind of definitely early on um, during the design phase. Um, how do you know which adaptation framework is the best fit for a project? Which, how do you pick? How do you pick an implementation science framework? You just choose which one you like, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think we we I'm just we were, were just most the ones that have been utilized the most in the research is the cultural sensitivity framework and the cultural adaptation framework. I think part of that is trying to assess and design interventions, especially uh, uh, cultural adaptations interventions, is just so large and huge that if we can break it down into kind of the five stages like Barrera and his colleagues did, it just seems a little bit more manageable. But I think, you know, I think, I think that's a, an important research question, a test, a test of a research question of what is the best cultural adaptive framework to, for your study um, and to real world settings. So. How do you get participation in your focus groups to even identify the adaptations needed? How, how do you start engaging that community? I mean, part of, if we're thinking back on kind of earlier, you know, some of the participatory approaches and methods uh, like the CBPR methods, I think I had just briefly breezed over. I think that is most important. So, so engaging in that work really beforehand to, to get your buy-in from your community. Um, and I think but that happened in kind of the program of research that I described before I came on board. And it was something that my doctoral advisor had been doing for years uh, in terms of working with this community as well as trying to identify, you know, we're, we're talking about like, like when we started the greater Los Angeles area, it's a big area. Um, and so we actually had to utilize things like Craigslist to try to get people to come in um, and, and really, you know, publicize in areas that wouldn't seem, I guess at the time, something that we, we would have used. But now it seems like we do talk about recruiting from Craigslist all the time. So I think 
putting in the work ahead of time in terms of engaging your stakeholders and really helping them understand understand the problem, how does it fit and, and work with them and, and, and then getting their partnership in terms of how do you how do you then solve that problem? One more question here. So I'll, I'll do this one last question and then give everybody a little bit of a break before our poster session starts at the top of the hour. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the, the difference in, in nativity? So the US born versus foreign born and how that affects mm -hmm. um, the, the cultural adaptations that you've implemented. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we did measure generation status. Um, I think, you know, th also thinking about kind of the geographical context as well, you know, a lot of um, in the greater Los Angeles area, you're more likely to have second, third generation Latino women, whereas in North Carolina, you're more likely to have first and second generation uh, Latino women. And that's something that we assessed for and also controlled for in our outcomes. And we really found that there wasn't that much, there was, there was no difference between um, you know, generation group. A lot of the women, I think in North Carolina were foreign born women, um, uh, Latino women from, you know, Costa Rica, Colombia, um, Cuban, Puerto Rico. And so we really have to consider, part of that is considering the qual, in your qualitative approach is how do, how does ethnic variation influence engagement in this treatment. And so something that we've done with the focus groups is, okay, is what you've described as, you know, a, a woman from Venezuela different from someone who, uh, a woman from Puerto Rico, is, are they the same or are they different? So being really explicit that you know that there will be ethnic variation in engagement in these interventions. And so how does that then inform um, your adaptation design and outcomes? But great questions, everyone. Please feel free to reach out. Email is um, here. I'm happy to talk cultural adaptations. Um, and yeah, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you so much, Noi. Um, thank you everyone for your participation and hope you join us for our poster session starting in just a few minutes. <laughs>